Is it recording? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, yes. Welcome. Uh, okay. All right, everybody. Uh, for today's class, we are looking at um, the next topic, uh, which is uh, gender in Malaysian literature and English. Uh, I'm going to go straight into um, uh, the discussion. Uh, we're looking at gender representation overall, and we're looking at the issue of gender representation in Malaysian literature and English. So when we think about gender, primarily uh, the, the key concepts that we need to look at is it's the difference between gender as a construct, meaning man-made, and gender that is more biological. Uh, that, is, that is what you are predisposed with. So if you look at these binaries, man, woman, female, male, masculine, feminine, masculinity, femininity, which is the biological given and which is the um, uh, environmental sociological construct? Which is biological and which is a construction? Probably masculine femininity is the construct, and then the given one is so called female or male. So, this, or, really, this yeah. you, you feel this is biological, and yes. this is more construct. How about the others? Do you agree? We only have 40 minutes, guys. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> For me, I, I agree, I think. Huda and Ali, like if you think about your own identity um, as a man and a woman, is being a man and a woman a biological thing or is it a cultural thing? Is it a sociological thing? Is it, is it something that is nurtured by society or is it something that is given? Meaning that is, you know, you, you understand it because it's part of your biology. Uh, it's according to the some countries the term in every country there is a uh, specific masculinity and also at the same time uh, femininity so, so when, according you say, to, when you say it's according to uh, uh, the environment or some countries that is a uh -huh. construct that is a construct so you yes you agree uh, so basically, the masculine, feminine, masculinity, femininity tends to be a construction. Uh, what it means to be masculine, what it means to be feminine, it can be uh, rewritten. You know, what is masculine in the uh, 20th century might be different from the 21st century. What is feminine in the 20th century might be different from the 21st century. So the idea that Gender is a construct, is something we need to debate. That's something we're going to focus on uh, in this topic. So some of the things that you also have to remember always when you are looking at issues of identity in fiction, start by asking the same questions to yourself first to get a kind of a baseline. How do I understand gender? Is gender uh, an important identity marker for me? How did my, my guardians, my grandparents, my parents educate me about being uh, a member of a particular gender, about being a boy or a girl? And then ask yourself, how, how was my society's uh, uh, expectation imposed on me as part of my upbringing? you know, uh, in terms of what you wear, what colors you choose to wear, in terms of how you wear your hair, in terms of, I mean, can a boy have long hair? You know, if the boy is growing up and the boy like, I don't want to cut my hair, I want to have my hair long. And then can the girl have short hair, you know, for instance? Uh, you know, I, I don't like long hair, I want to keep my hair short. And then will your parents or society say, but you're a girl, you should have, a lo you should have long hair. And then for the boy, you know, but you're a boy, you cannot have long hair. So those are aspects of societal expectations and cultural expectations 
that govern the way the individual is raised uh, as a boy or as a girl, you know? Uh, so uh, these questions help understand, help inform your sense of gender identity. So when we think about gender identity, there's two sides to, to this issue. On the one hand, you've got the kind of a more private experience uh, of what it means to be a man or a woman, you know, a male or a female, the more private experience. And then on the other hand, you have a more uh, a public uh, social cultural prescription. So you've got on the one hand, the experience and the experience is unique. You've got Alice, Huda, Jennifer and Raihana, uh, four individuals uh, 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 growing up in four different uh, backgrounds and cultural, religious and, and time background. So we each have a different private experience of what it means to be a member of the female uh, community, right? So that's very private. But collectively, you can, you can share notes and, and decide whether or not the collective experience are similar. Maybe uh, you've got, um, you've got you know, four individuals from four different backgrounds. But somehow, there's something that, that is kind of the same. There's something that is echoed in terms of the way the society prescribes to us what it means to be a, a member of the, uh, uh, the, the female uh, community, in terms of our femininity, in terms of our expectations. So I just, I'm throwing all these ideas right now. If you've got questions, we will try to cover it later. And in terms of theory, uh, even though this, is, uh, this, this excerpt is not from uh, gender studies, uh, W.E. Du Bois uh, wrote uh, an article uh, in the late uh, 19th century uh, in the 1800s on, uh, I forget the exact date, somebody look it up, the souls of black folk, uh, describing the experience of uh, the African-American, the blacks, the Negroes, right? And he describes this sense of two-ness and this idea of two-ness, even though it's taken from um, uh, the race theory, we can appropriate it we can appropriate this concept into today's discussion on gender because what Du Bois describes uh, the experience that uh, the colored person experiences, this two-ness, this sense of two-ness that, you know, this double consciousness of looking at yourself from your point of view and looking at yourself from somebody else's point of view. It, it comes across in race, it comes across in minority experiences, but it can also be replicated in gender studies, you know? So the, the word is appropriate. That means you take something from another context, you appropriate it into another context. So uh, this notion of tunas, I wanna appropriate it into our discussion on gender studies. This notion of double consciousness, uh, what does it mean? The sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of the world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. That means you see yourself, your identity, that is mirrored by how others perceive you. So you know who you are, but you also know how others perceive you. And that second perception, not your own perception, the, the other person's perception is what causes two-ness, two souls, two thoughts. One is your own thought and the other is how other people are viewing you, right? Minorities experience it uh, uh, throughout, uh, throughout our world history. Um, uh, minorities from different backgrounds have experienced various kinds of um, uh, subordination um, by the majority, by people of power, and they have experienced this sense of two-ness. Now, in gender studies, 
this concept is also applicable. So look at this particular quote. Another quotation, individuals from dominant social formations have never developed their imagination about how they look to the marginalized other, uh, others. As a result, women often make sense of men's, uh, men's image of women better than men understand women's point of view. So that, that idea of when you are on the margins, you, you tend to see your perspective as well as how others or the dominant perceive you. Do you understand that concept? Um, so far, okay. Do you, do yeah, you all talk? Okay. Yeah, but the those in the center, it's difficult for them to see those the, the point of view of those on the margins. It tends to be those on the margins who are able to perceive uh, how the, the people in the center view them. Uh, that is what, what the, the, at the core of double consciousness, that's the, that's the relationship. This notion, this, this subjugated knowledge, that means you have a knowledge, you have an understanding of being because you are placed you are placed in the subjugated, marginalized, subaltern, and othered position. Because you, you are on the margins of society, you are able to view how society perceives you and how you know yourself to be. That's the root of double consciousness. So if we take on uh, Du Bois' notion of double consciousness, if you appropriate it into the context of gender studies, specifically women's studies, huh? masculinity studies, we will look at it in, from another point of view. Uh, women's subjugated knowledge is second sight. That means it's, it's almost like you, you grow up knowing if I dress in this way, I'm going to get a lot of comments. You know the kind of reception you are going to get even before you get it, right? because you, you grew up with that kind of um, upbringing and nurturing. And, and you know what will get you into trouble and, and what will not. Uh, am, I, am, I, uh, am I getting through to you all? Do you understand what, what I'm trying to, to express here? It's very clear, Doctor. Yes, Doctor. Yes, Doctor. Now, now we come to a particular uh, a cultural uh, construction uh, called patriarchy. Uh, again, it's a construct, okay? Patriarchy is a construct, uh, which means it's, it's man-made. What is patriarchy? Patriarchy ultimately is the way gender is arranged, arrangement of gender, which forms, so, uh, the male folk is in the in the top tier, and the female folk is in the bottom tier. So the roles of society is headed by men, by those who are in positions of authority, and they are they are they are men. That is patriarchal. If it is uh, the female uh, in some societies, the female uh, hold the position of authority. This is a matriarchal, not a patriarchal, but a matriarchal society. Uh, there are parts in Malaysia, um, in Negris Milan, this is a state in Malaysia, uh, where it's more matriarchal. So it's, it's the rules uh, tend to favor the, the, the female and they, they have a stronger hold in the way um, the community is governed. And that's a matriarchal society. But, but the patriarchal society is one which the male role is given a higher status. And you will see a lot of stories in which uh, the patriarchal culture is, is um, the central culture that governs society. So for instance, this idea that uh, um, the, the identity is based on uh, the masculine sense of identity is not necessarily patriarchal, but it's more uh, male construction. 
uh, another example would be when uh, the emotions, you know, the, the emotional repression where certain emotions are, are kept down, you're not allowed to express certain emotions. Uh, that can also be seen as part of the patriarchal cultural value. On that note, have a look at this poem by um, the diasporic Malaysian uh, American poet, Hilary Tham. Uh, the, the title of the poem is What Men Never Do, you know. So straight on from the title, she's already suggesting something that this, these are some things that men never do, you know. So Ali, you may look at this and you may kind of ask yourself how far this, this poem is true because the title says what men never do, not what certain men never do, not what Malaysian men never do, or, or you know what men never do. Just, just very universal. There's a kind of a universality uh, uh, in the title itself, right? So, so have a look at this poem. So the, the poem says, "A man should weep. A man should weep. Should weed out the phlegm of silences stuck in his throat." women do so you sit quietly beside me at the station that you then you hung silence around my neck and turned back to dig holes for your garden so there's a lot of things happening there's lots of gaps in this poem yeah a lot of silences what's happening here where is this where is this poem what's the setting you know, at the station. What station is this? Because this person uh, uh, is describing someone uh, called you who turns back to dig holes in your garden. So is this person at the station? Is this person somewhere in her garden? Is it a he or a she that's speaking? So a lot of things that we can probe. I'll talk about this poem next week further. We'll discuss this poem. But I just want to introduce this to you here to talk about the construction, the cultural construction of, uh, of the men. So men should weep, should weed out the phlegm. Phlegm is the, the um, you know, the mucus that comes out from your throat area when you've got, when you've got like a sore throat or whatever, you know, that's, so the phlegm of silences stuck in his throat. So that's a metaphoric statement. So the poet is, the persona is suggesting that men are not weeping enough. Men weep uh, is, is not just to cry, but it is also an expression of emotion. You know, when you are able to express your emotion, you are able to shed tears, you know, you're able to show, to be more vulnerable. To be more vulnerable. Vulnerable. Okay. To, to show your emotional side. Okay. But are men allowed to show their emotional side? Are men allowed to be vulnerable? So this is something uh, we discuss in gender also. Uh, another aspect of uh, 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 gender construction is the, the notion of inferiority, how inferior a particular gender is. Are women more inferior than men? Are men more superior than women? So this is the kind of a binary uh, uh, discussion with regards to gender. And when you, when you look at... Uh, the issue of gender in literature, you may even want to investigate how the writer uh, positions the women characters. Are women characters shown to be more inferior in terms of her ability to function in society, in terms of her knowledge, in terms of uh, her, her ability to uh, uh, do things in society, you know? Um, another concept 
with regards to gender, which I introduced um, when we're talking about uh, Ravi in um, the return and, and plural society, is this notion of the inappropriate other. Trin Minha, uh, in, in her works, uh, um, problematize this notion uh, when the individual is treated neither as an outsider nor as a member of society, nor, at, nor as a genuine member of society. So the individual is part of society, but the individual kind of like is on the margins because the individual does not subscribe to the cultural values. The, the, the individual lacks cultural affinity. Whatever, whatever the culture is, the individual kind of like moves away. A little bit like Ravi in The Return, uh, when he uh, challenges some of the uh, cultural values of the, the Indian society in, uh, in the estate that he grew up in. So he's not an outsider. He's not a non-Indian. He's an Indian, but he suffers the effects of marginalization because he does not share their cultural values. And this is, this is a concept called inappropriate other. So in gender studies, maybe writers uh, create characters who are female, but do not subscribe to the feminine uh, expectations of society. Or maybe they are men, but they don't subscribe to the expectations of masculinity of the society. For instance, in this poem, uh, the, the writer indicates that the, the person, the persona, the persona indicates that uh, men are not doing enough of weeping. Men should weep. Basically, the unsaid uh, the answer is, men are not crying enough. The answer is, um, men aren't weeping. But in society, when men are not expected to weep. So in a sense, this poem indicates that uh, the construction of gender is very much the way society, a patriarchal society, constructs men, right? Uh, the inappropriate other shows, uh, it's a concept that shows how the men or the women uh, breaks free from uh, society's expectation because he or she does not subscribe or does not um, all right, move away. does not abide by society's uh, values necessarily. Uh, I'm going to skip this part and because we don't have we don't have the time, but I just want to kind of focus on the central demands of feminism. Feminism as a movement, uh, it started in the 20th century, about 100 years ago. Uh, it's gone through different uh, phases, you know, first wave, second wave, third wave, you know. But at the core, feminism began uh, in, the, in the West uh, to champion uh, for equality between gender, to champion for social justice uh, for women specifically. Uh, uh, it's to break free from cultural restrictions imposed by society onto women, hence it's feminism, okay? Uh, and, and the themes that is generated by feminism uh, uh, can be, yeah, the themes that is generated by uh, the theory of feminism and the movement uh, includes looking at the issue of voice. Are the female characters given any voice? Are they mute? Are they silenced? Uh, are they given a, a, a voice? Are they given uh, something to say? If you remember from the return, uh, I said how I was very disturbed by the fact that Ravi's mother was never given any lines to say. She wasn't given any presence his stepmother had something to say, 
his stepmother could actually ask for Ravi to be sent to the English school. She had a voice, but the mother was almost silenced. You know, it, she was almost muted. It's like her, her, her identity was not important enough for the story. So that's an issue for gender, if you want to look at it from that point of view. Then uh, about social justice, uh, when uh, Karupi, the stepmother, uh, voiced uh, to uh, Naina that Ravi should be, that she got a dream. Uh, in her dream, she saw that Ravi was sent to the English school. Uh, the, the husband beat her up, right? So this issue of when a woman speaks, her voice is not as important as the man. And the man has the upper hand to physically harm her if he feels she is, uh, she's being a nuisance, she's being a troublemaker. So that social justice for women is not, is not available. That's another aspect of gender. Is it equal between men and women? Does Ravi get to be sent to an English school? Does his sister... Do his sisters share the same equal, equal treatment or is it only Ravi? That's something else. Uh, something that is uh, connected to voice is visibility. This is more physical. Uh, this is obviously, it's the voice. So uh, is, is the female character visible? Can you see the female character sense of identity, uh, the character's thoughts and ideas and, and you know? as well as the notion of agency. Um, okay. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the opening uh, paragraph uh, from this short story by the Malaysian writer Che Husna Azahari. She's a professor of engineer uh, from UKM. She retired a couple of years ago. So she's an engineer by profession but she also writes uh, prolifically uh, in, in Malaysian literature and English, in the canon of Malaysian literature and English, uh, especially 20th century uh, short stories. Uh, so, so she's a female uh, writer. Che Husna is a female writer. Uh, uh, this is the opening. So, so keep in mind, so, so this is a 20th century short story writer. She's a female writer. Now look at the way the female character by the name of Maria, uh, look at the way she is described. The she here is, is this character called Maria. This is how the story opens. This is the second paragraph, I think. That particular morning though, most of the men were not eating their breakfast, but instead their gaze was fixed on the main entrance of the square. The setting is, this is a marketplace and Maria goes to the marketplace every morning to sell her food, to sell her cooking, her rice and, and stuff like that. So every morning, the men go to the marketplace, to the, 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 the open air market space and they are like looking at the entrance and all eyes are transfixed on this figure that is coming through that entrance, you know? And, and it's a figure of a woman. And what is the woman doing? She's walking, she's delicately balancing two huge basins on her head, her hips swaying gaily to and fro to the rhythm of the balancing. That particular gyrating seems to mesmerize the men and glue them to their space. So if I go back to the, the, uh, the key concepts just now, if I go back to the key concepts just now, just based on the opening paragraph, based on the opening paragraph, is Maria given a voice? Do you hear her voice? No. Do you feel, do you no. feel her presence? Do you feel her sense of her, her sense of presence, her, her physical presence? Well, physical, I think a little since she was described, her figure was given. But is her physicality as a subject or as an object? 
object. She, Probably this mostly is, an object. So this is not visibility. This is a sense of objectification. Objectification. She is objectified as an object. She's just an object. Like, like if I showed you this bottle. Can you all see the bottle? Yes, doctor. Yeah, so this is yes, doctor. Object. The object doesn't have a voice. The object cannot speak for itself. I have to speak on behalf of that voice. That's what an object is. If this was a subject, this subject can speak for herself or himself. So that's the difference between the way um, the way uh, the way uh, Maria in this in this opening is being described. Okay, so she has no presence. Maria does not have a presence because people are gazing on upon her upon her figure all right upon her hips where's hips? Hips, hips, hips hips upon her hips all right upon her physical presence her her figure you don't hear her voice you don't know what she thinks you don't know what she likes and she and she what she dislikes does she like to be watched like that why does she allow herself to be in that position why does she allow herself to go through that where people are looking at her. And this is a Muslim society. Husna comes from a, a northern state, from Kelantan, which is a very strong um, Malay Muslim uh, uh, community. Uh, so for her to show a female character from this point of view, that is the reason behind it. Why would, why would Maria, the central character, put herself in this situation? It turns out, as you read the story, it turns out she is a widow. Her husband has passed away and she has to, uh, she has to uh, cook and sell her, her cooking as a form of uh, uh, earning a living because she doesn't have anybody taking care of her, right? So indirectly, she's having to put herself through this. And this, in the story, uh, uh, the imam, uh, the, the religious figure, falls in love with Maria and decides to take her as a second wife. And his first wife has to agree because she is not able to conceive any children. So there's a sense of, you know, it's like, what's the woman's worth? What's her identity based on? Is polygamy allowed because the woman cannot conceive? So all that is being problematized in this story. Okay? Uh, are you all right so far? Okay, doctor. Okay, how, right. many, how many minutes? How, how many okay, minutes? doctor. Uh, how many more minutes do I have? Does anybody know? How long has this been recording? Mm. Never mind. Okay, we're moving on. Uh, and another story, this time around by the Malay, uh, Malay uh, Eurasian. His mom, his mom is uh, his mom is British. His dad is Malay, Karim uh, Karim Raslan. He's a lawyer by profession, by by training. Sorry, not profession by training. He's also now a, a radio um, uh, host for for BFM programs and various things. He's also a writer, so so various things. But look at look at the opening of his story called Heroes. Okay, Fariza is a female uh, character. Um, uh, Naima is also a female, the wife. Look at the opening uh, of this story called Heroes. When Fariza, my daughter, was a little girl. We played a game we called, Are You Sleeping? The game was enough to keep both of us entertained, meaning father and daughter entertained, okay? For the half an hour or so, it took my late wife, Naima, to prepare my dinner, not our dinner, my dinner. So there is that element of patriarchal uh, values being imposed here. Uh, uh, dinner is prepared by the wife for the husband and the husband uh, uh, will entertain himself whilst the wife is in the kitchen preparing. So, so you see 
that cultural roles in, you know, incorporated in just in this one statement. So what about the rest of the story? So you can see other aspects. Uh, in uh, K.S. Maniam's short story, Haunting the Tiger, uh, look at the way he describes this young woman who later becomes his wife. Not, not Maniam's, but the story in the story. Okay, The young woman sitting beside him wasn't brought any nearer to him. She was the strangeness that he had to give himself up for to know. This is how he describes getting married and, and being with this woman. He had to, he, he told himself, actually jump out of his skin and be refashioned to fit into a life with her. That's how, that's his definition of marriage. In this story called Haunting the Tiger. So when you look at uh, the issue of uh, gender representation, look at how the writer depicts both the female and male characters. Look at also how the writer gives voice to he, but not any to she. So the female characters is voiceless. The male characters is voiced. So if this is how the female, uh, the male character feels being married to a, a woman, how does a female character feel? Do you get her thoughts? Do you, do you in this short paragraph, do you get the female's thoughts about what it means to, to live with this man? Nah, we don't know. Okay. Okay. So, so the, the female voice is voiceless. The female is voiceless. Even though she appears to be the subject of the sentence, right? In this sentence, the young woman, that's the subject. This is the verb. And this is the object, right? But the subject is not given any voice. It's the object, the him, that is given the voice. This is how he feels. She is the strangeness. He has to literally rip himself out of his body, refashion himself, poor thing. You know, he's got to go through all this transformation just to fit into a life with her, poor thing. You know, but she is not even given a voice. We don't even hear what she has to go through. Does she want to be married to him? Does she like to be married to him? Does she want a life with him? Does she have anything else she wants to do besides get married? Those questions are not asked. So that's an aspect of gender that, that you can problematize also. Uh, in, in this short story from Young Women Speak Out, uh, uh, the character experiences uh, physical uh, abuse. You know, the, the female character experiences a, a physical abuse, okay? But the way... The, the way she is asked in terms of whether or not the thing that happened to her, the physical abuse that happened to her was something that she brought on is, is interesting. Have a look at this. If I'm not blaming you or anything, but this could have been avoided. If you only took my advice and had not gone to his place alone after drinking alcohol, you know how guys are. They're not thinking with the brain up downstairs. They're always thinking with their brain downstairs. You should have prepared yourself. Guys cannot control themselves. It is the girls who draw the line. I'm not blaming you. He still shouldn't have done it. So who takes responsibility when an abuse is suffered by the women? So that is another aspect of gender that you can problematize if you are interested in looking at gender. Um, another aspect of gender is uh, uh, when we talk about identity. Um, you know, um, your sense of identity is your name. 
What else? What else makes your identity? Chop, chop, chop. Come on, 40 minutes. Hurry up. Name? Uh, gender. Usually, gender. whether you're a girl or a boy. What else? And how old are you? Your age? What else? And probably uh, what nationality or race? What uh, else? Skin yeah. color. Really? Uh, skin color. Interesting. Okay, what else? What else? Behavior. Your behavior? What else? Education. Sorry? Education. Education. What else? Can we say language? Good. What else? Religion. Good. For me, this is this is the highest. This is the top. Whether I'm a man or woman doesn't matter to me. My name doesn't matter. My age, God knows, doesn't matter. My nationality, it doesn't matter. My skin color, it, it's never been an issue. Language also. Education also. But this is the most important for me. Now, have a look at this particular excerpt. Always ask yourself the question before you approach the text. What is the most important aspect of identity for you? Now, have a look at this excerpt. The qualities that make me a feminist and activist are the very same ones that make me fare so badly as a daughter. So, uh, uh, there's a kind of uh, uh, a, a tension between the me and being a daughter. There's a kind of a tension, okay? Because whatever that the qualities that makes me a feminist and an activist and you know all those things that makes me the identity that I am, they also kind of they don't sit very well as me as a daughter, my identity as a daughter. There's a kind of a tug of war between the two. You know, the 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 qualities that makes this person a feminist and an activist are qualities in which she questions the patriarchal power lines, right? But that is also the thing that causes her not to be an ideal or a good daughter. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a good daughter or an ideal daughter? Should you be questioning the patriarchal power lines? As a good daughter, sorry? Obey. You should obey. You should be. You should listen, uh, and and follow, and not challenge, right? But as a feminist, as as her her uh, her preoccupation, uh, as a as a feminist, she doesn't obey. As a feminist, as an activist, she doesn't obey. She questions. And that's the thing that gets herself into trouble, right? So just looking at this short excerpt, it shows you uh, the tension that happens in the woman. And this is the sense of two-ness. This is the sense of uh, double consciousness that Du Bois talks about. So this, this person, this individual, understands that this is who I am and, and this is what society expects of me. This is what society expects. So this is the two-ness. This is, this is number one, this is who I am, and this is number two, what society expects of me. So this is the notion of two-ness, double consciousness uh, uh, that Du Bois uh, talks about at the beginning when I showed you the excerpt. So if you want to look at this, uh, uh, if you want to analyze the, this notion of this notion of two-ness, you can you can uh, look at Du Bois's uh, article and bring that as a lens as a, uh, uh, to investigate that aspect. Um, uh, another dimension of gender is not binary. Women are like this, men are like that. You know that's that's very much a black and white. Uh, kind of a, a gender binary. There are elements of complexity 
in gender representation, both in the, uh, the representation of the father or the man, as well as the representation of the women or the mother in this case. So if you look at this excerpt, uh, have a look at how the father and the mother are, are positioned. Um, uh, feminism and the spiritual understanding of life to a certain extent has helped me to understand my family relation, relationship dynamics. I only hope that I have a better understanding now of the psychological and emotional turmoil my parents had to go through for going against their gender roles. So in this story, the characters, mom and dad, challenged the gender roles. Mom did what was not expected of a mom and dad did what was expected was not expected of a dad okay um uh, i began to see i began to see my father as courageous a uh, courageous person who despite having to bear the burden of shame of experiencing financial failure still stuck around and loved us I now see beyond my mother's business-like demeanor within and out of the home and see her as a person whose determination to make it in the man's world, despite her insecurities, was fired by love, fierce sense of duty and loyalty towards her, her family. So I want you to unpack this a little bit. What's happening in this, in this context? What's happening to the father? He, he suffered financial failure. He lost his job. He suffered financial failure and that caused him a lot of shame. He was not able to take care of his family. He lost his job. He lost his income. He was not able to be the breadwinner. What happened to the mother? The mother had to go out and earn a living in a man's world. You know, And it wasn't easy for her because she, she felt insecure about it. But she had to do this. Why? Because of duty and loyalty. So in this story, the gender roles are reversed. But it's within, not within the society, within a family unit. And that caused a lot of turmoil, a lot of, a lot of tension psychological and emotional. Why? Because society expects the men to go out and work and the women to stay home and take care of the children. But in this family, in this particular family unit, the father lost his job. He couldn't get a job. So the family was without any income and the mother had to go out and pretend to be very business-like, to put on this act, even though she felt insecure because she was, she was um, motivated by her love and her sense of duty and loyalty towards her family. She had to do it to take care of her children. She had to do it to earn a living for her children and her family. You know? So this is another example how you study uh, uh, gender representation. Okay? So um, are we still recording? I hope we're still recording. Okay, so was that all right so far? Yes, doctor. Okay, doctor. Yeah. Yes, so when it's you look, clear. when you look at uh, Malaysian literature in English from the perspective of gender, this is how you do it. So have a look at the lecture notes and the concepts that I have introduced, um, and maybe you might be interested for your second assignment for the seminar uh, to look at Malaysian literature in English from the perspective of gender. Gender doesn't mean just female. It doesn't mean just male. It can be looking at both the male characters and the female characters, uh, or it can be looking at the male characters, or it can be looking at the female characters. Okay. Uh, uh, for instance, if I use uh, the return as an example, uh, you may look at the female characters, or you may choose to look at the male characters. How many male characters there are there? There is Ravi. There is his uh, father, uh, Naina. There is Menon, the head of uh, the, the community. Okay? And, and these male characters uh, come from different generations. 
you know, Naina and Menon come from uh, the older generation, Ravi comes from the younger generation. How are their identity as men or as, as, um, as uh, boys and men, how are their sense of identity constructed? What are the things that they are expected to do? Uh, what are the things that is a privilege to them uh, uh, that, that the female characters uh, do not have? Uh, for instance, you know, uh, education, uh, being able to school in an English uh, school, being able to go to town, being able to go out uh, and earn a living, for instance, you know. So have a look at the stories and, and look at it from that perspective. Any questions? Oh, sorry, there's something on the chat. Okay. Uh, any, any questions for me? So far, okay, doctor. I, yeah. For me, it's clear, doctor. For, for me, it's okay, doctor. Okay. Uh, Huda, all right? Okay, I need you to, I need all of you to, to kind of uh, uh, look at any stories or short stories or novels that you are interested in. You know, I've given you two novels as a primary text, The Return and um, The Garden of Evening Mist. You can look at these texts, one of these texts for your seminar if you're interested, or you can look at any other text. You can look at it from the perspective of gender for assignment two. You can look at it from other uh, uh, themes. It's your choice. Uh, but for, uh, for gender, uh, uh, you, you decide what aspect of uh, uh, gender representation you want to focus on uh, based on today's class. Uh, the, the notes are there. And then investigate how the writer represents gender in his or her uh, works of fiction. Okay, any other question? Before, before Zoom kind of like disconnects us and, and yeah. Mm, I'm okay, doctor. Okay. Victor, you mean that that will be related with assignment two, is that right? Yes, you can. For assignment two, uh, assignment one is literature review, right? Where you looked at articles. Assignment two, would be more uh, text-based. You look at a particular short story, a novel, or poem, and uh, you study it for, for any of the aspects that we've discussed. It can be on um, uh, the plural society. Uh, it can be looking at um, uh, language, the nativization of the language. Uh, you can look at it from uh, the perspective of gender. Uh, so you can use... Uh, the novel, The Return, to look at any of these things for assignment two, or mm -hmm. you can choose a text. If you remember, uh, in the first two weeks, I asked you to go online and, and do surveys of, of writers that you are interested in. And some of you looked at uh, Shannon Ahmad, um, Selena, and, and various other uh, examples. So go back to that task and ask yourself, am I interested still to, to investigate this writer's work? And mm -hmm. then explore that for assignment two. Yeah. Okay, Victor, all right, thank you. Okay. Because I leave it to you to decide on the text. I don't want to prescribe a text for you, mm -hmm. but uh, the few texts that I have introduced, you can use it for any of the assignment. Mm -hmm. I just forget the second name of the novel. You say uh, either the return or the return of name? garden garden of evening mist. Did I send you all a, a copy, an ebook copy? I forget. I don't. Uh, don't ask, doctor. Don't okay. No, it's okay. I, uh, yeah. Oh my god. Okay, okay, okay. I I thought I had already sent it to you. Um, I I have a, an ebook copy. I will send it to you. Uh both on UKM Folio as well as on the WhatsApp. Um, but if you are interested in any of the stories uh, that I showed just now, uh, Maria or Heroes or any other stories, let me know. I can try to scan the story and make it available. Okay, okay we, will, we will tell you okay, later thank on. Thank you, Doctor. 
Would yeah. you know would I, would I say something? Uda, did you want to say something? Doctor, but it has to be a Malaysian canon, not yes. other. Uh, no. Okay. It has to be. It has to be uh, a Malaysian short story. Uh, sorry, a Malaysian writer. Yeah, yeah. Which is why. Which is why at the beginning when I uh, the first, uh, the first task that I asked you all to do was to go online just to look at what's available online and which writers are you interested in and and stuff like that, just to do a quick survey so that whatever you decide to do for assignment two and assignment three, it is based on your interest. Thank you, doctor. Yeah, welcome. Anything else? Okay, so far, okay, doctor. Thank right. you, doctor. Okay, doctor. Thank you. Okay, now because we are not on Teams, I'm not going to be playing your videos for today. I'm going to postpone that, but you have uploaded it on UKM Folio, correct? Yes. Everybody? Yes, doctor, but uh, mine no, is didn't. still the last time I signed. Uh, I record a new one. Uh -huh. the, the, the new one you can be uploaded with. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, my laptop uh, was suddenly died on Monday and lost some lost the video and uh, I borrowed one laptop uh, to record it yesterday night. Okay, so now I I, I just want to make sure that you all have finished your first assignment. You know, uh, I don't want yes. this assignment to to not be done. Just make sure you finish it when we view it. Uh, we can decide later, but what's most important is you've done with first assignment, you are now moving towards assignment two. Okay? Uh, and Dr. assignment... Me, sorry. Hmm. Sorry, Dr. Go ahead. Uh, yes. For me, I have completed and uh, sent by UKM Folio, but just to be sure if you got it or not. Okay, I will check on that. As long as you have a copy, uh, uh, if... if uh, the connection is down or whatever. As long as you have a copy, uh, you can always resend it to me personally. But okay, I want okay. all of you to have finished assignment one and start working towards assignment two. Okay, the turn is okay. Everybody start working, oh, okay. working for assignment two and, and, and talk to me and uh, consult with me for assignment two. You have, I think I, I have uh, maybe two more lectures, uh, two, I think, two or three more lectures. I forget, I'll check my schedule. Uh, and then we'll be done for content. Uh, but, but you start to think about your second assignment because technically your second assignment is due next week, technically. But of course, I can give you more time. But what I would like to know is what are you interested to uh, present a seminar on second assignment is more a seminar where you take charge of the session for 20 minutes or so and I will send you the rubric for that like what am I looking for as a seminar it's not just about you talking uh, you must also engage your classmates you know you may ask them questions you may uh, probe them with some visuals some pictures some some quotations uh, uh, have a conversation uh, with, with your classmates. And, and in the course of the presentation, you go through your thesis statement, uh, your research questions, your methodology, your analysis, and your conclusion based on the text that you have chosen to study. All right. Uh, so first assignment, it was a literature review. Second assignment is more based on uh, a text that you have chosen. The text can be a novel. We've read the return. You may, you may choose other texts that you are interested in, but it has to be something within the canon of Malaysian literature in English. So I would like to hear your thoughts next week. Ken? Okay, doctor. Okay, so doctor, just to confirm the seminar is next week? No, no, no. It's supposed to be week nine, but because okay. we pushed the video essay by, by one week, so the seminar would be the week after. Okay, okay. Thank you, doctor. But, but oh, I have two doctor, more. Sorry. Sorry. 
so the next week, the class for the next week will be just to give some ideas about uh, our next two uh, assignment two. Uh, uh, so next week, I will consider it a workshop week, which means uh -huh. you come to class like this and you show me your draft, you uh -huh. show your ideas and what are the things you're working on. And uh, we will also use that time to watch your videos, your video essay, your first assignment video essay. Yes. yes yeah. so okay. Next week, do not waste it, meaning make next week a working week, which means you prepare something, you may have PowerPoint slides and stuff like that, which means the following week, so this is week eight, today is week eight, next week yes. is week nine, so week 10, you are presenting your seminar. Good. Okay. We have, then we have, if I'm not mistaken, we have two more lectures. If I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it's, doctor. It's at all 14 lectures. I think so. Uh, 14 topics, but some of the topics are overlapping. Some of the topics I, I make it for two weeks. Uh, so, so technically we're like, we've got seven topics to cover. Mm -hmm. Okay. Week five, all right. uh, I think. This is topic five, so you've got two more topics, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, okay doctor. Thank, thank you. you. Thank so you. I already okay. thank you, doctor. Topics uh, that can help you with seminar with your second assignment. Please choose one of them. It can be on plural society, it can be on language, it can be on uh, gender. Choose uh, one of the topics and, and start working on your seminar. And next week I want to see your draft. The draft can be a PowerPoint based on PowerPoint slides. It can be Word document, whatever. But I want something concrete. The most important thing is a thesis statement. What is it that you are trying to uh, investigate in this seminar? What are you trying to uh, uh, study or investigate or, or examine? The thesis statement of your presentation is the most important part of your presentation. Once you have that, I can help you with your methodology and, and all the rest of that. Okay, any question? Thank you, Doctor. For, me, for my thesis, Thank I just you. think about to choose uh, in a far country, but not decided yet. So I will inform you soon I choose the text. Yeah, the thesis is not the text. The thesis is what is it about the text that you want to study? Maybe you want to look at the way identity is constructed. Maybe you want to look at how the male character sense of gender identity is constructed. How is Rajan the central character? How is Rajan's masculinity or, or lack of portrayed by Maniam? Or you want to look at the, the cultural diversity in the story or you want to look at identity, uh, Rajan's sense of identity uh, as a Malaysian. How is he being challenged by that? So there's many, many things you can look at uh, in that story. Uh, but the thesis is what I want to hear from you next week, all of you. Okay, doctor, all right. Not it. Any, anyone? Hey, Thank you so far. All right. <laughs> Uh, Huda, okay? Yes, doctor. Okay, I'm going to stop recording now.